All right, we're going to stick with the markets now. Now that we've got some real thoughts in terms of the economy, we've talked with several voices. You just heard from Ed Yardeni. Right now we've got another voice when it comes to the equity trade and the investment trade. David Bonson is with us. He's chief investment officer for the Bonson Group, and he joins us uh, via Skype. David, nice to have you here. We've got a rally, a uh, Santa Claus rally for a day, perhaps. We'll see what mm-hmm. happens tomorrow. Uh, when you look at the environment, can you really get a good feel of what 2023 holds for us? I don't think in the very short term you can. It's not so much a trader's market. I think there's a lot of uh, volatility, back and forth uh, aspects that are more technical and much more unpredictable. Um, into a more intermediate term time horizon, I do believe people at least know what the questions are that need to be answered. I, I don't believe that the inflation story is one of great mystery. I don't believe inflation is created, first of all, by a- economic growth by too many people having jobs or by the consumer uh, having too much optimism. Inflation is created by there being too much money supply relative to goods and services. And the production side, the supply side of the economy has picked up dramatically. It was woefully unprepared for the COVID reopening. And we've fought through that for about a year and a half, two years now. But I agree very much with what Ed Yardini said earlier. I think that the inflation aspect is going to surprise to the downside. And yet the valuations of high growth stocks remain too high historically to put a lot of optimism in indexes or the growth side, the FANG story. Therefore, we remain value investors and cash flow investors heavy on the dividend aspect of the market. OK, we'll get to some of those uh, picks in, in just a minute. First, though, I want to hear more about what you're thinking in the context of, of, of the Fed. If we do indeed see an inflation surprise to the downside in 2020. Does that mean uh, the Fed actually can cut rates? Well, at some point they will, and I don't but think in it's particularly important. I don't think it's particularly important if they cut in Q3 versus Q4. At at some point, the question is the terminal rate, not when cutting begins. And I think that terminal rate is 5% soaking wet, maybe 475. Hmm. In other words, we're one or two more small hikes away from reaching it. And, And the issue the Fed has to deal with now is more messaging. How do they explain with an inflation rate coming down um, why they got so tight. And I don't think they can say what I believe, which is that asset prices were too high. They had overinflated housing. The broad inflation narrative gave them cover to really over tighten. But we're also, let's not forget, as we talk about interest rates, going to have to deal with this balance sheet side as well. They've gotten a whopping $400 billion off of their $9 trillion yeah. balance sheet. Like so nothing. quantitative tightening is going to be something to watch next year as well. Yeah, I'm surprised we haven't heard a lot more folks uh, talking about that. I mean, if you get an acceleration in that, I mean, that pretty much is good for a few more rate hikes, uh, at least uh, on an effective basis. I am curious, David, if you just kind of give us a sense here. When you look at market pricing, and I know market pricing over the last couple of weeks is probably distorted by the lower volume, but I'm curious as to when we talk, start talking about a terminal rate of five, but you still have uh, rates uh, for the most part under 3% uh, on certain parts of the curve and well under five on the rest. Uh, and then you have an equity market that at least wants to rally here. What's the message that's being sent? I mean, what are investors betting on, even if they don't necessarily see the same reality as you? Well, let's keep in mind that the Dow is a different story than the NASDAQ, for example. The NASDAQ right now has compounded at a grand total of 3% per year for 22 years. Okay. Okay. It's a stunning fact around its drawdown that it's experienced. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the large growth, high valuation, high beta side of the market is looking to rally. A lot of the darlings, the biggest cap companies have really stubbornly refused to participate. And some of the great performers of the last couple of years have struggled even in the fourth quarter as most markets are up, Apple, Tesla, etc. I think it's more about a reversion to the mean, that mm. you have value that was so disconnected from its normal relationship to growth, the quality is just benefiting. And this is so similar to what we saw in 2000. Now, in 2001, 9-11 distorted a lot of this. Mm. We had a minor recession in 2002. 
But that's a story that I think doesn't get enough play, that you can have a recession, you can have a bear market and still have some things in the market do well when other things are not. That's really what I expect going into 23. But David, when you talk about some of these big tech stocks, is it fair to lump them all in one basket? You know, Apple being the same as Meta, being the same oh. as, you know, Netflix. I mean, how do you differentiate? Because there's got to be some that are opportunities. Some of these names sell a lot of stuff and are highly profitable. Right. All of them sell a lot of stuff and all of them are profitable, but none of them are opportunities. And I agree 100 percent. They're not monolithic. And it's something I've said on this show before. And I've been saying for a couple of years, even when they were all going up, they weren't all going up at the same pace. Now, this year, when you have the best performer down 30 ish and the worst performer down 70 ish, it's all pretty bad. But you're right. Those are two pretty different numbers. I think that the profit outlook and the growth outlook is different for all of them. And what's unique is that like with Meta, for example, it's a real fundamental problem mm -hmm. where with Apple and Google, I think it was just a valuation problem. Hmm. The problem is a growth catalyst. What is exactly going to give it a couple more turns in a P.E. ratio? I don't have the foggiest idea what would make Apple trade up 25 percent at this stage of the economy. In terms of technological innovation, there's nothing that's going to give it that kind of boost in, in 2023. Given that we've seen a decline in some stocks that we traditionally classify as growth stocks uh, like a Netflix, like a Tesla, like a Meta Platforms, for example, uh, we've seen price declines that perhaps show that there could be more value plays. Would you consider that a, a reason to get into some of these stocks, given that the price has declined so much that the metrics now show that they're value plays? Again, we're not, saying, growth not saying Tesla by any means, by the way. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be a great exception. But no, um, mm -hmm. I like the idea of that. But in, in fact, they're not there yet. Now, what happened with uh, Microsoft and Intel, where they became value plays out of the financial crisis? They were big dividend payers. They had 5% dividend yields back in 2009. None of these companies we're talking about, with the slight exception of Apple, pay any dividend at all. I do think they're much lower, but they're not value valuation yet. Um, looking at the free cash flow yields, for example, there's still a ways to go. I'd love for that to happen. And a lot of those old companies that were big growth stories in the 90s, Cisco, Qualcomm, Intel, became value plays right. later on and ended up getting a lot of great performance out of that value level. But the FANG story is far from being there. It's far from being there. Uh, let's talk about, I guess, maybe what could potentially be those next growth stocks. There were a lot of folks betting, uh, whether it was on, I guess, bets that didn't pay off, you know, like the Pelotons of the world. Others like Tesla uh, and, uh, and others uh, seem to have maybe uh, shown a little bit more hope and promise. Where do you see it? Yeah, I think that Tesla has always uh, had to rationalize its valuation on being more than a car company, but being a platform around future battery utility. And um, you have just a very mixed bag with the CEO. A lot of people love him. A lot of people hate him. Um, I don't ever love the idea of someone who oversees a company worth hundreds of billions of dollars having a second job or a third job or a fourth job. Now, in fairness to him, he's done it for years. I mean, even before Twitter, he had SpaceX and, and these other issues. But um, it's it's just not something we can get excited about without the free cash flow generation mm -hmm. that we want to see. But if one forced me to pick which of these growth names that has gotten hammered of a big capitalization, I think has the most upside opportunity, it would be Tesla. Um, the other types of categories, you mentioned Peloton and some of those yeah. work from home stocks. Prior to the break, you guys were talking about Beyond Meat. These are companies that hedge funds have to go pick after yeah. if maybe they can be a private equity takeout mm. because they have no chance of ever making real big boy money to be a, a major publicly traded company. Uh, Beyond Meat is right. down 80, 90 percent, and it could go to zero. But a private equity company will take it out before it mm. goes there. Those just aren't the things we look at and what we're doing. All right. Private equity in 2023 is a completely different conversation, but one we'll certainly have in the coming days. David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer at the Bonson Group, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us this afternoon. Really appreciate it.